When I first came out west, I drove all around, exploring the awesome, but also awful and incredibly creepy prairies. I mean, where can you drive for a solid hour and not see a single person, a single living thing, other than a distant bird of prey, riding a thermal high in the sky? One place I explored was Roche Per Se. The Roche Per Se is a sandstone rock formation weathered into strange and unusual shapes by wind, snow, and rain. It is a natural landmark and was a rendezvous point for the Northwest Mounted Police on their trek out west. Some of the early Mounties even wrote their names on the rocks, all of which has faded away. Too much snow, too much sun, too much wind. We came there in the early spring, when there was still a bite of winter in the air. The rock formations radiated a prehistoric weirdness that completely captivated my imagination, as I tried to imagine how they must have appeared to the first redcoats back in 1874. It was then I noticed the skull. It lay in a natural depression or niche in one of the huge sandstone boulders, the skull of a small animal, possibly a gopher or a vole. It gleamed whitely against the weathered ochre of the rock and looked like it was put there deliberately. Put there deliberately to tempt someone to pick it up. And, of course, so I did. I felt a thrill of energy, a blaze of white and pinkish light, and then everything became dark and obscure, and I slowly realized that I was in my bedroom, and it was night. Not that I was seeing things through my own eyes. In instead, I was observing myself through a pair of eyes which seemed to hover somewhere near the ceiling. I was alone. The eyes watched as I got into bed and grabbed a book off the bedside table. The Collected Ghost Stories of M.R. James. I somehow knew which story I was reading. It was, There Was a Man Dwelt by a Churchyard. The little skull lay on the bedside table, shining whitely in the warm glow cast by my reading lamp. I turned the page, and then my perspective changed as it does so often in dreams, and I had just started a new paragraph, when I became aware there was something at the foot of the bed. My initial shocked impression was of something tall and thin, a being eight feet high, emaciated and, and covered with, with bark? Bark and, and grungy matted fur? The spindly legs were bent backwards, like an animal, and the fingernails were long and sharp. The eyes were black and seemed to radiate a cold and cosmic darkness which penetrated my soul and almost stopped my heart. What was it? A wendigo? A skinwalker? A flesh gate? A manitou? It pointed a black and bony finger at the little skull, and I knew instinctively that it wanted it and I never should have taken it. I reached for the teeny skull, and it was upon me. I felt the crimson burning agony of claw and razor-sharp teeth, and everything went blood red, then black. Are you all right? My girlfriend had grabbed my arm. Everything was spinning, and I was unsteady, as if I was drunk. What's wrong with you? I, I don't know. I just had a vision. I didn't add that I had been looking at the skull, which sat primly in its niche. I'm driving home. <laughs> well, for once I didn't argue with her. I told the above story a few days later, talking with Jarrett as we threw back a few lucky loggers in my backyard. I think it was a warning to leave the skull where it was. It must be some kind of totem or something. Huh. Ah, oh, you're so full of it. <laughs> I suppose you would have picked it up. 
Sure, I don't believe in that paranormal crap. Well, I bet the skull is still there, so help yourself. <laughs> As if I'm going to drive three hours to pick up an old skull. Ah, but he did. I had forgotten our beer talk when I got a frantic late-night call from Jared. You remember that skull down in Roche, per se? Uh, we were talking about it last Thursday. Uh, vaguely. I remember it vaguely. you got to help me. There's something in my house, and it wants to harm me. What? I went down to Roche, per se, and got the skull. You did what? That little animal skull, the one that gave you the vision. I took it, and now there's something in my house. I can feel it. It's always watching me, and sometimes... Sometimes it even talks to me. Huh? What does it say? It says, whispers really, that I've broken a taboo and have angered the spirits. Worse, it, it seems to imitate my voice, like a bad tape recording. And then it whispers, I'm going to die. Have you seen it? No, it's always at the periphery of my vision. But I, I think it's getting closer. I'll be there in ten minutes. I didn't fancy driving the dark rural roads of southern Saskatchewan in the pitch dark, but there was no choice. Jared was waiting for me at the front door and practically dived into my passenger seat. Have you got it? I asked. It's in this container. Okay, okay, let's go and hope whatever you've offended finds this to be acceptable. We hadn't gone far down the benighted Highway 6 when I heard Jared gasp and then say, There's something outside the car, outside my window, and it's running along beside us. And it's keeping pace with us. Whatever you do, don't look at it. What is it? I don't know, but I'm not going to speculate. Just, just don't look at it. Just look straight ahead, like me. Okay? We drove south through the all-encompassing darkness, both of us staring straight ahead at the road, as illuminated by my headlights. I was concentrating on my driving, but I still almost lost control when our mysterious companion leaped onto the roof of the car. Gripping the wheel with white-knuckle concentration, I found myself worrying about whether he, or it, was going to scratch the paint. We're being threatened by a paranormal entity which could tear us to pieces, and you're worrying about paint, I said to myself. It was enough to make you laugh, but I didn't find it funny. I was too shit-scared. It took us over three hours to reach our destination. In the gathering gloom, the low, dense cloud cover veiling any light from the moon and the stars. We sat a moment in the car, both breathing heavily. I said, When we get out, we walk directly to the spot as quickly as we can. Keep your eyes on the ground and don't look around. I I'm going alone. I don't want to get you into this. Screw that, I'm already involved. Quit arguing and let's go. I'll bring the flashlight. We stumbled up the trail to the rock formation, eyes glued to the path. But even though we didn't look around, we knew we weren't alone. Something big was moving parallel with us, following at our heels, just to spring away. I didn't want to look around, didn't want to see eyes maybe glowing in the shadows. We finally reached the spot. Jared put the skull back in its original position, gently, reverently, and the moment he did so, uh, we felt a sense of calm, of peace, descend upon us. I couldn't see Jared's face clearly in the darkness, but I sensed he was smiling. I'm safe. We're safe now, he said quietly. And then it was upon us, the crimson burning agony of claw and razor sharp teeth, and everything went blood red, then black. Black.
It was New Year's Eve, just before midnight. I was with my friend, the skeptic. We were standing by a stretch of new concrete sidewalk and looking across the frosty expanse of a vacant, garbage-strewn lot. We were each drinking a bottle of Bow, a beer best described as being for external use only. It was the popular beer in Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada in the uh, 1950s. Why are we here again? The skeptic whined. To test a hypothesis, I said. Hypothesis. I always had trouble with that word. Ah, uh, which is? That deceased murderers are condemned to reenact their crimes. I gave him the backstory. In 1955, the mummified body of an elderly man, Mike Tudor, was found in a shack in Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada. The shack had stood on the vacant lot my friend and I were currently looking at. He had been murdered. Later, a 300-pound woman of extremely easy virtue, Tootsie La Flesh, and her one-legged boyfriend, Jake Dick, were charged with murdering the old man on New Year's Eve, 1954. And no, I am not making these names up. Tootsie had lived in the shack for months, while Mike's body slowly decomposed. Luckily for her, it gets very cold in Regina, which might have helped the aroma inside the shack. Tootsie got five years for being an accessory to murder, while Jake was sentenced to hang. But he appealed, and was eventually acquitted, and walked, peg-legged, into the sunset. Jake's alibi was that he was at his brother's on New Year's Eve, at the time of Mike's murder. But could he have slain the old man earlier, bouncing around on one leg while Tootsie egged him on, and then quickly stumped to his brother's place to establish his alibi? If so, and if ghostly murderers are doomed to reenact their crimes, so, you think his ghost is going to stump past us? Uh, yeah, something like that. Shit, that's the goofiest thing I've heard from you yet. <laughs> well, what better way to spend New Year's Eve? Shit, you're repeating yourself. And do we have to drink Bo? Atmosphere. Atmosphere? It's more likely to cause gas. He took a pull on his bottle making an exaggerated grimace of disgust. What bloody time is it? Any time now. For what? A pregnant pause, but one filled with a sense of expectancy. And then we heard it, a series of scuffs and thuds which seemed to come from the vacant lot, muffled footfalls which suddenly became loud taps as whatever was approaching reached the new concrete sidewalk. It was heading in our direction. What the hell is that? It is the sound of a peg leg on concrete. He's even got fresh cement to help him pump up the volume. The taps seemed to come closer, and as they reached us, we felt an icy chill, a sudden and extreme drop in temperature, which had nothing to do with the weather outside. It made you feel like you would never warm up again, ever. The sound of the taps moved away from us and eventually faded into silence. The skeptic's mouth was hanging open. Eventually he was able to close it, but opened it again to whisper, what was that? You heard, I said, someone in a hell of a hurry. And you think, I think it means that Jake was guilty. That he murdered Mike and then hurried, 
on his peg leg to his brother's place to establish an alibi. Or he knew Mike was dead and was trying to distance himself from the crime. And he's condemned to repeat his flight every New Year's Eve? Uh, looks that way, doesn't it? For eternity? Perhaps. A and there's no chance of redemption? Somewhere, a solitary church bell began to ring. The new year had arrived. Perhaps, perhaps ultimately, there is forgiveness for all of us. For all our sins, I said. At least I pray there is. We finished our beers and left. P.S. I first heard of Tootsie, Jacob Dick, and Mike Tudor back in 1981 in Frank Jones's book, Trail of Blood. I then read more about the case in the back issues of the Regina Leader Post for 1955, available at the microfilm section of the Metro Toronto Reference Library. I remember thinking Regina seemed a wild and interesting place. Ten years later, I was living there. Fate? You tell me in the comments section below. And drop a like and subscribe for more ghost stories of a librarian. A Paradox Life was stricter in the 1970s, but people, especially young people, had more freedom. Don't believe it? Well, consider the tween-age phenomena of camping out in the backyard. Would today's helicopter parents expose their precious angels to the dangers of being kidnapped? or falling victim to a serial killer? Probably not. But we had no problem sleeping out circa 1972. <laughs> Maybe our folks were hoping we'd be kidnapped. I never asked. Uh, I guess I didn't really want to know. But one hot summer night in 72, we were lying on our sleeping bags inside the stifling interior of a tent in Rapp's backyard. It was the usual crew, and we were too bored, or lazy, to move. Too lazy to go to the 24-hour ranch supermarket for chips or old port colts, rum-flavored, wine-tipped. Too lazy to go to Tim Hortons. We exhausted all the jokes we knew, both clean and obscene, and were reduced to such grade two classics as What did the floor say to the wall? Meet you at the corner. We'd also run through all the ghost stories and urban legends. The Hook, Don't Look Back, Bloody Mary, Humans Can Lick Too, The Spiders in the Hairdo. They all got a yawn. We'd all heard them a million times before. I think the school library is haunted, I said. I didn't have any proof it was haunted, but the classroom always gave off a weird and dismal feeling any time I was alone in it, especially on cloudy afternoons with the overhead lights turned off. I always felt like someone or something was watching me. Of course, there were rumors about kids who died at school 
or off themselves because of the mean teachers. But no one ever had any particulars, as in the kid's name and what really happened to them. So it was just a feeling. But I sometimes did wonder, could it be haunted? My comment fell on deaf ears. Nobody cared if it was haunted or not. But someone was listening, because Rap said, Let's sneak into the school. Shemp snorted, not loudly. How could we do that? Turns out it was easy, back then. Back in the 70s, there was no CCTV, and few places had security systems. So all you had to do to enter a building like the school was to climb through an open window. In this case, it was the window of the supply room, which, according to Rapp, was always left open about an inch above the bottom of the window frame. So we simply raised it, and voila, we were inside. I was the one who said the school library was haunted. But haunted or not, it was creepy to be inside a deserted building at night, in the dark. Our footsteps echoed in the empty hallways, even though we tried to be quiet. At least, most of us. Hey, where's all the ghosties? Rick bellowed, his deafening voice releasing a cacophony of echoes. The echoes eventually died down, but then the silence was broken by a loud crash. What the? We all said at once, and I answered the question with, I think it came from the library. You and your haunted library, Rick snorted. At this point, I was in favor of heading back to the tent, but Rap said, Let's check it out. As I said, I always found the library a weird and dismal place in daytime, but it was appalling in the semi-darkness, and on the floor we found a stack of books which had evidently fallen off a nearby shelf. That's what made the noise, Shemp said. Yeah, I replied, but why did they fall off? We were interrupted by Rap turning on Rick and stammering, What, what did you hit me for? I didn't hit you. Well, then who did? Oh, you'd know if I hit you. And then something pinched my ear. But there was no one close to me who could have done it. I realized in an instant what was happening. Uh, It's a ghost. A a poltergeist, I think. Oh, a ghosty, Rick said with disgust. Oh, who shit, Rap wanted to know. For just then the room was filled with the most appalling stench I've ever been forced to breathe. It was so bad, it made me glad supper had been hours earlier. Otherwise, barf. But before we could accuse each other of being the stinker, the foul odor was replaced by a bone-rattling chill, a deep freeze which left us chattering and shaking like we were having fits. Without a word, we all made for the open doorway. And the damn door slammed shut. Rick tore at it frantically, and even though Rap was swearing at him to pull the effing thing open. The big guy cried, I can't budge it. I heard Shemp gasp behind me, and I whirled around to see the room was possessed. Books flew off the shelves, danced through the air, while the big oak table by the window began spinning, and the chairs capered about like they were dancing. The globe on the librarian's desk was spinning, like it was planning to take off. Shemp instinctively reached out to grab one of the chairs, only to be violently thrown aside, crashing into Rap and slamming him against the wall. The door suddenly flew open and we flew out. The door then slammed shut behind us, opened, and slammed shut again. And then all was silent. (sighs) 
I think we all breathed a sigh of relief. Silence. Blessed silence. Until we heard someone shout, Hey! We froze, figuring we were busted. And given what was happening, we, we were almost happy to be caught. We waited for the cop or janitor or teacher or whatever to come and call her us. But nothing happened. I, I thought I heard Rap began to say, but Rick interrupted with, What the hell is that? In the gathering gloom, at the far end of the hall, we could make out a white spherical object which appeared to be floating. And as we watched, it suddenly became bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger as it came flying towards us, mouth agape, shrieking like a banshee. I don't know how we got out of there. I dimly remember climbing the fence. And then we were back in the tent, gasping for breath, not even worrying about waking up the old folks. It was about 20 minutes before anyone spoke. Then Rap whispered, still short of air, uh, That must have been a floater. Hey, what, what about that stuff in the library? I managed to say. Oh, uh, we just scared ourselves. Like a bunch of little kids, Rick choked out. What about the books, I said. Uh, they fell down. The awful smell... Ah, uh, somebody farted. I gave up. We just lay there, waiting for our heart rates to go down. Then Shemp said, Let's not go back. Nobody argued for once. We just lay there, falling asleep. Rick murmuring, Bet we imagined the whole thing. And that's when we heard it. A low, ominous chuckle right outside the tent. Something slapped the canvas wall next to where I lay. It could have been a hand or a disembodied human head throwing itself against the tent. And then we heard a mocking voice say ever so softly, Good night, boys. Pleasant dreams. We stayed put for the rest of the night. But we didn't sleep. Or even close our eyes. A VIEW FROM A HILL At the rear of Niagara University, at the very edge of the escarpment, there was a grassy knoll which overlooked the city, several hundred feet below. Dubbed by some student wag, the Rooftop Café, it was equipped with a pair of comfortable granite boulders which provided natural seating for those who wish to enjoy the spectacular view of the city and the lake spread out at their feet, or who simply wished to get drunk and or stoned. During the wee hours of a hot midsummer night, two students were seated on the rocks, getting plastered. They had been across the river in the nearby U.S. of A. and had acquired a sack full of cheap but highly potent forties of malt liquor. They had been discussing such philosophical topics as sports and women and women and sports and had then moved on 
to dystopian fiction. One student, let's call him Chuck, wasn't shy about sharing his opinions. Ah, forget the zombie apocalypse, bro. It's the NBA apocalypse we have to worry about. Civilization will be slowly strangled by red tape, eh? Yeah, whatever, bro, said his companion. Let's call him Chris, who was in an exceedingly mellow mood. The midnight city lay directly below them, the street lights looking like diamonds or pearls lying on a mantle of black velvet, while a ripe yellow moon hung directly overhead. Chuck was reaching down to retrieve another 40 when he became aware of someone standing directly behind them. Startled, he said, Can I help you, buddy? Chris stood up from his boulder in surprise. Who the hell are you? The stranger was clad in black from head to toe. His, or her, face covered by a dark hoodie. They didn't speak, but held out an offering, which looked like a bottle of Kraken Black Spiced Rum, which instantly made the newcomer welcome. Thanks, bro. Uh, don't mind if I do, said Chuck, reaching out to take the bottle and raising it to his lips. He wasn't sure if it was rum or not. All Chuck knew was that it was the most wonderful liquor he had ever tasted. It seemed to shoot right through him, and he could feel it tingling in his fingertips and toes. Oh, bro, he gasped, holding the bottle out to Chris, who wasn't shy about taking it. When he had finished drinking, he choked out, oh, what is this stuff? But when they turned to look for the hooded figure, it was gone. And that's when they heard the first scream. Turning to look back at the city below, the friends were surprised to see more light. A lot more light. It now appeared that every home beneath them had all of their lights turned on, including porch lights and security lights. The streets seemed to be filling with people, too. Filling with people at two in the morning? And they looked like... No, they were fighting. Fighting. Chuck and Chris could hear the mingled shouting and screaming, as well as the sudden blaring of car horns. What the... Chuck started to say when he was interrupted by the first gunshot. The first of many gunshots, as the noise of sirens and emergency vehicles began making the night hideous with their strident wailings. Somewhere, down in Western Hill, a fire had broken out. What's going on, bro? What's going on, bro? Chris kept saying over and over, as if it was a prayer. They noticed the bottle. The magic bottle was still there, and they instinctively reached out for it, and drank, and drank, and drank, and drank, as the city burned in a cacophony of shots, sirens, screams, a crescendo of violence. They were too stunned to speak, and eventually passed out, while the full moon turned blood red. They awoke to the sound of birdsong. A bright morning sun was shining in their eyes, forcing them to squint. But the city that lay before them seemed undamaged. Is that smoke, bro? Chris croaked. Nah, that's just from a factory or something. I passed out. Huh. You think? 
Yeah, well, so did you. Yeah, so? It must have been a dream, eh? A bad trip. They noticed the empty bottle on the ground between the boulders, prompting Chris to rhapsodize. That was some liquor. What was it anyways, rum? I don't know, Chris said. It was the amber of the gods. Or the devil. Probably the devil. I wonder what I Oh my god! Chris looked towards Chuck and saw that he had turned as white as a sheet with his eyes popping out of his head. He turned and looked behind him and then he saw it too. The red brick residence building directly behind the knoll was now a burnt out wreck with fires still burning inside it. The cars in the attached parking lot were charred metal with grotesque and distorted bodies, some surrounded by pools of blood, lying at odd and obscene angles all over the bloodied concrete. The rest of the campus lay in ruins, a massive cloud of smoke obscuring the horror. The bros turned back and looked down at the city, and now they could see the ruined homes, the corpses lining the roads, the still burning fires, and even as they looked, birdsong was drowned out by gunshots. The world's ended, Chris sobbed, while Chuck kept screaming, Why? 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 They both noticed the hooded figure at the same time. It was walking up the side of the knoll towards them. As it drew level, it pulled back its cowl to reveal a gleaming white skull. It no longer clutched a bottle, but raised its voluminous sleeves towards them, its skeletal fingers pointing both at Chuck and at Chris. And then it took a step forward. And then another. And another. And then, the world truly ended. A Neighbor's Landmark In every community of young people, there is a threshold experience, a rite of passage between being a kid and becoming an adult. Some places, it's as simple as getting your driver's license, going to the bar for the first time, or losing your virginity. <laughs> as if that's simple. But in other places, it's an ordeal. Where I grew up in the 70s, the rite of passage was pretty basic and bowel-watering. At intervals along the side of the local train bridge, there were a series of small platforms for railway laborers to stand upon should a train pass while they were working. Each platform also featured a 55-gallon steel drum opened at the top. So when a boy wished to become a man, he would squeeze himself into one of the steel drums and wait for a train to pass by. I know, because I did this when I was 12. It probably sounds stupid. It is. But it's also terrifying. After all, you're only about a foot away as a speeding train roars past you, and it looks like it's going to run you over as it charges towards you. The noise as the train goes by is terrific, which is a good thing, 
as you're screaming at the top of your lungs the whole time. When the ordeal is over, you stagger from your hidey hole, then pull yourself together and walk staunchly up to your buddies and declare loudly, That was fun. Think I'll do it again. But nobody does it twice. Nobody. But in more recent years, the threshold experience has been to ride your bike along the North Service Road at midnight on Saturday night, alone, alone. And if you ask what's so bad about that, they'll say Headley. And if you ask who or what is Headley, they'll say don't ask. But unless a kid has been living under a rock, they already know who Headley is, or was, a macho jerk of a biker who liked to ride his chopper, minus a muffler, down the length of the service road at midnight, going as fast as two wheels and a bad attitude could take him. Unfortunately for him, he pissed off the wrong people, who strung piano wire across the darkened road and decapitated him. They say the headless rider continued in a straight line for about a mile before falling into a ditch. So the North Service Road is haunted, haunted by the ghost of Headley, the headless biker. Yeah, right, thought Maggie. Her girlfriends had dared her to ride her bike down the haunted highway on Saturday night, Headley's favorite evening for putting in an appearance. She thought it was stupid and was pretty sure they were going to prank her, but she figured she could do it. Hell, she'd have to do it. The forfeit, if she failed, was just too embarrassing to think about. But she thought about it and picked up the pace, the faster to get it over with. It was a nice night for a ride. There were no cars on the service road and few on the highway directly to the south. She hadn't bothered with a helmet for her midnight ride and was enjoying the feel of the warm wind in her hair. She was scanning the road in front of her, on the alert for someone jumping out or screaming from one of the fields to the north, and was so busy keeping her eyes front, she didn't really think about what might be behind her until she took a quick glance over her shoulder. Far behind her, on the horizon, perhaps as distant as the fourth line, she could make out a pinprick of red light. She stopped momentarily to stare at it, but it was so far away, she was sure it didn't concern her. And so she rode on. But it was no longer as much fun as it had been earlier. The road had gotten darker, if that was possible, and there seemed to be fewer cars passing along the highway. A lot fewer. It had suddenly gone all quiet. So quiet, she could hear the sound of a revving motorcycle off in the distance. A motorcycle? A noisy motorcycle? Without a muffler? It's got to be my so-called friend, she thought, pretending to be Headley the Headless Horseman. But she was surprised they had come up with something so elaborate. She had been expecting them to jump out with bedsheets over their heads screaming, Boo! Boo! That was more their speed. She pulled over to the side and took another look back, realizing the red light she had seen earlier was the headlight on a rapidly approaching bike. They're in a hell of a hurry, Maggie said to herself. I'm going to step to the side here and let him fly on by and wave. Ha, ha, ha. 
She turned to take another look at the rapidly approaching red headlamp and then knew in her gut it really was Headley and she had to get out of there for there flashed through her mind a series of frightful images of screaming women pushed to the ground of a man with a bleeding face slashed by a broken bottle of the wheels of a chopper bearing down on her of a decapitated head rolling across a road and into a ditch. She had to get out of there. Now. How far was the Esso at the Cloverleaf? The one next to the country squire. A mile? She might be able to make it, in high gear. She'd have to make it. Maggie took off down the service road peddling like she had the devil on her trail, on her tail, the hellhounds on her trail. And that's exactly how it felt, that some fiend was pursuing her, and she dare not turn back to look. But she had to, had to look, as if she was being forced to look. The motorcycle was much closer now, and gaining fast. And while it did indeed have a red headlight, Maggie could now see the entire bike and its dark-clad rider were radiating a crimson glow like the light from a distant fire. Or the fires of hell. She could see the rider clearly. What she couldn't see was a head. It was moving incredibly fast as if it was gliding through the air and not running on hard asphalt. Maggie rode like she had never ridden before, forgetting about safety, about the darkness, in her frantic attempts to get away, to get to safety. But in her heart she knew she wasn't going to make it. And then he, Headley, was there, and she told herself to keep on riding, just keep riding. Please, please, let me get to the Esso. Please, please, I'm almost there, and I'm almost in. Not gonna look. 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 Not gonna... She looked. At first the reddish halo made it hard to see, but when her eyes adjusted... She was appalled to see that the rider had pulled up directly beside her. He was dressed entirely in black leather, including gloves, but had no head. They were riding side by side. Somehow, the headless biker was adjusting his speed to match that of Maggie's bike, and she was seized with a new horror. Oh, God! Don't let him touch me. Don't let him touch me. She knew it would be somehow unclean. Unclean. She feared it might be deadly. Deadly. Headly. Deadly. <laughs> deadly headly. Deadly headly. She began to chant out loud. Deadly headly. Deadly headly. Deadly headly. Deadly Headley! Deadly Headley! Deadly Headley! Deadly Headley! Deadly Headley! The headless biker suddenly shot out his hand and grabbed Maggie's wrist, and she went into a spin and hit the ditch. Maggie had the wind knocked out of her, and her wrist hurt, hurt badly, as she crawled from the ditch. But he, it, Headley, was gone, and the sheer relief made her overlook the pain. She managed to pick up her bike, but she didn't think she could ride it. But it wasn't that far now, maybe a mile. She could walk it. As she looked down the dark stretch of road, she could see a white object in the distance. It looked about the size of a baseball, and it seemed to be hurling towards her. 
Instinctively, Maggie began backing up. And as the object approached, quick as greased or greasy lightning, she could see it was a human head, an ugly human head, with acne-scarred cheeks and a Fu Manchu mustache and wearing dark glasses and a German army helmet. Headley. It was Headley. Maggie turned and began to stumble down the road as Headley's head whizzed past her ear. And then the evil head swung around in the air and racing back smacked directly into her forehead. And all was darkness. Maggie's friends, hiding under some old white bedsheets, were in a field and waiting for her to pass by. When they got tired of waiting for her, Geez, Louise, it's one o'clock already. They went to look for her and found her lying unconscious in the middle of the road. In the middle of the road, not far from the ditch where Headley's decapitated head had rolled so many years before. They got her to emergency, where Maggie was found to have both a concussion and a broken wrist. But given time and rest, she made a complete recovery. Her friends never brought up the fact that Maggie hadn't completed the dare, so she was relieved from having to carry out the forfeit. The forfeit was actually pretty gross. But on reflection, Maggie decided she would have gladly performed it if it meant missing her late night date with Headley. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed this adaptation of my grandpa M.R. James's story, A Neighbor's Landmark. For more dope on Headley, please check out my earlier video by that title. And please drop a like and leave a comment and subscribe for more ghost stories of a librarian.